David, we had a very clear uh, view there of this audience, which we think is, is representative, that a majority should come. Can you just give a quick response there from the people of Hong Kong? Yes, I should tell you there was a loud ripple of applause when that vote was taken here. Perhaps I could put the question to Martin Lee. What's your response to the views expressed and to that vote that was taken? I'm very encouraged by it. It, it in fact supports what I've been saying, thinking all the time, that the people in Great Britain are honourable, but not the government. <laughs> David? David, thank you very much for that. And I'm going to, to come back here now to Sir Geoffrey. You heard what the people said in that audience, Sir Geoffrey. You heard what was said in Hong Kong. You saw that vote. We don't pretend that that is a precise referendum. However, it is a clear reflection that a large number of people do share the view that the people of Hong Kong should be allowed to come in here. In the light of that, and in the light of what you said about the anxieties concerning doubling potentially the ethnic minority of this country, do you think perhaps you may have rushed to judgment, misjudged the, the temper of the British people, the sense of honour that they have? I think not. No, I can think that it's very understandable that an audience of this kind, assembled in a programme of this kind, presented with the case in such direct human terms as this, uh, would feel that it wanted to respond in that way if it possibly could. I think one has to take one's mind back to the practicalities that were being emphasised by some people. If you take your mind back, you see, to the much smaller tragedy we faced when the East African Asians were turned out of their home. We had then tens of thousands of people, only a very tiny handful. That created the most formidable problems. I believe that those problems will be repeated on a much larger scale in face of the possibility of three and a quarter million people from but, Hong Kong. But given that the government's role in these matters and in others is to lead, would it not uh, be incumbent on you if this view that we've expressed here, and there's been a Gallup poll which has come up with very similar results, very even balance, isn't it incumbent on you as it were to, to seek to reflect that apparent tolerance rather than to shut it off with the view that apparently you believe the members of parliament would hold if you sought to modify the law to let those people in? One has to reflect all the factors and I fully understand the, the extent to which people would like to reach out in this way. I fully understand Is that. Is a change possible? I, I think one's got to think very, very deeply before one contemplated that possibility. But if you... The fact is, you Sorry. see, uh, if one looks at the whole problem and, and Martin Lee uh, raised a, a matter in a rather different sense. He said that he didn't even think we were trying to create a future for the people of Hong Kong. I, I hope and believe that those with whom I've worked there over the years we've been concerned know that we have actually put all our effort and all our energy to trying to establish a future on the basis of the agreement which was warmly welcomed by the people of Hong Kong. Now, I fully understand the point made by some later on about the extent to which the events of recent weeks have shattered a view that has built up in the last ten years. I fully understand why people are making the bid they're now making that we've been discussing in this programme. But I come back to the fact that for a British government and the British Parliament to accept the obligation to admit three and a quarter million people uh, is, an, is, is an obligation we should have to regard as realistic. And I think it would be a very, very formidable step to commend that. It would be, if I understand you correctly, unrealistic if the people of Britain were to say, no, it is not on, and then the consequences which you outlined at the beginning were to follow. If, however, your judgment became that those problems would not inevitably follow, if the people of Britain shared the view that it was intolerable to contemplate what might happen to the people of Hong Kong, I put it to you that you would be under some obligation to reconsider your judgment. I think that the position is one that we have, of course, to consider and reconsider the whole time. Um, I, I come back to the fact of our immense and intense concern with the future of, of this territory and the people who live there. But one has to try and put it in the broader perspective uh, r without being driven to the commitment that you're trying to... I, I, I don't seek to drive you particularly to commitment, just to establish exactly what your position <coughs> is. Um, would it not be an astute judgment to make that the best possible time to make any commitment, any ultimate guarantee, which you hope 
will not have to be honored because you hope the Chinese government will return to civilized behavior again. To make that judgment now and not perhaps down the road when things are much worse, when the prospect of social disorder within Hong Kong itself may be even more intense. I think that there are two points I'd to pick up in that sentence you put to me. Uh, one is the recurrent phrase, make a judgment and an offer, which you hope will not have to be fulfilled. Every time the question is put on that basis, it is being put literally and directly on an irresponsible basis. One cannot make the change on the basis that it may not have to be fulfilled. And that was a point accepted by people in Hong Kong as well as here. If one is ap approaching the question on the footing that any undertaking might well would have to be fulfilled, then I'd suggest to you that now is actually not the best time to be contemplating it, because now is a time when we're all deeply shocked and appalled by what's happened in Peking. Uh, and, and we need to spend some time looking at it in a rather longer perspective. I fully understand the sense of shock and dismay that is prevalent now, and I share it. But I don't think that it's the right time to make a fundamental change of judgment of that sort. The judgment that's still being upheld, the case that I'm putting, you see, is the one that uh, commended itself clearly to Parliament eight years ago. It's remained in place and largely unquestioned until now. I see why it's questioned now. I don't think now would be the right time to reach a conclusion in the opposite direction. If you persist in the judgment because you believe it's the correct judgment, then down the road you also face the prospect that if you are wrong, if things turn out badly, then people could end up in Hong Kong in the same condition as we were horrified by when it happened in Peking. Not attractive for you to contemplate as a civilized human being, obviously, but possible for you to contemplate? Grossly unattractive. Uh, the fact, of course, is that Hong Kong in the years that have passed since the end of the war has been confronted with possibilities of that kind very closely and very directly. But you have the possibility as the Foreign Secretary to offer the sanctuary which would make that possibility an impossibility. No, I'm afraid it would not do that, you see. The fact is that if you were to offer, make the offer on the basis you're commanding, on the footing that it's intended to provide a refuge for three and a quarter million people, it's an offer that simply could not be fulfilled in those terms. I fully understand, totally understand the so, uh, dismay, the anguish, Jeffrey, the shock, the horror. For, forgive me, Sir Jeffrey, that is a, a point which you've properly made on several occasions in this interview. I want to put this final point to you briefly. If the worst comes to the worst, then this government, you as Foreign Secretary, not you as an individual, as a Foreign Secretary, down the road may witness the worst coming to the worst. Would not that be a matter of shame for you and for the British nation were that to happen? When one faces questions of this kind, one obviously recognizes the scale of the hazards and the horrors that have to be taken into account. I believe that it's right for us to go on working now to try and restore the prospects that were open to the people of Hong Kong, difficult as that may be, before we come to a conclusion in the opposite sense from that that I've been arguing for. Sir Geoffrey, thank you for coming here this evening. And thank you too to our contributors from Hong Kong and to our audience in this studio, because there we have to suspend this debate. I say suspend because there can be precious little doubt after we've, what we've heard here this evening that this is the beginning, not the end, of this grave matter. Good night.